Hello class, coming to you this afternoon. Usually I do these lectures in the morning, so this is my first afternoon one. Um, and this is a another three chapter condensed presentation. Um, this one is about the cardiovascular system. And we're gonna again cover three chapters, chapter 15, 16, and 17. Um, I've condensed this one into I think 42 slides. Um, so about the same as the last unit. Um, so apologies about that. But again, I'm trying to cover everything cardiovascular system in one lecture it can be a little challenging, but we'll do our best. Okay, so chapter 15 really focuses on uh, the anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system. So we're going to start there. Um, a lot of exercise physiology books actually will lead off with the cardiovascular system because you might say the cardiovascular system is the heart of exercise physiology. Ha ha ha. That was a really bad joke, but it's kind of true, right? Um, everything that we do depends upon the heart's ability to adjust its rate and um, force of contraction to supply adequate amounts of oxygen rich blood to the tissues that need it. So during exercise, there's going to be a huge increase in the amount of O2 rich blood that our muscles need. Therefore, the heart is going to have to uh, respond immediately to start sending more, a greater volume of O2 rich blood um, into circulation where the muscles can use it. Okay. So typically we say that the cardiovascular system basically consists of four components. Um, the first component is the pump, which is the heart, right? Um, some people think, say that the heart is two pumps sort of joined together. You have your um, the left side, which is systemic circulation, which sends blood into the rest of the body. And then you have your, your right side, which is the pulmonary side, which just sends blood through the lungs. Uh, and that's displayed um, here. We're notice that on the left side of the heart, what is exiting is in red, and that indicates that we have oxygenated blood leaving that side of the heart, okay? And then, as that blood circulates through the body, through the arterial side, which is in red, at the, ca the capillaries then surround tissues, and that's where oxygen and CO2 change exchange occurs. And then that blood then comes back to the heart in the pulmonary, sorry, in venous circulation, which is displayed in blue, indicating oxygen has been removed, okay? Uh, and then that enters back into the right side of the heart where it is then pumped to the lungs for reoxygenation. And then that blood leaves the lungs and comes back into the left side of the heart. Okay. Component two of those four components is what they call the high pressure distribution circuit. So that's going to be the arterial side. Okay. Um, the arterial side is where pressure is higher because that's driving blood from the heart down into the tissues. We have to have that pressure gradient, much like we saw last week with pulmonary um, function, high pressure, low pressure, Things are always going to move from areas of high to low. So if we have high pressure at the heart, lower pressure in the exchange vessels, that's going to drive blood from the heart down into those vessels. Okay. Component three then are those exchange vessels, which we will call uh, the capillaries. We'll talk about those more later. And then the fourth component is the lower pressure um, venous side, which is going to return blood ultimately back to the heart where it can then be circulated to the lungs and back into the left side of the heart, where it then re-enters the high pressure side, okay? Uh, so what we're gonna do then is talk about these components individually. So the heart, I've kind of already talked about. Um, there are four chambers um, in the heart. Um, let's jump back. Two atria, individually these are called atrium. So we have our right atrium and our left atrium. Those are the upper chambers. And then the two lower chambers are known as the, the ventricles. So the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Okay. 
So each side of the heart has two chambers, an upper and a lower. The upper are the atria, the lower are the ventricles. Um, here you see just a few facts about the heart. Um, the average heart weighs about 10 ounces. Um, males typically have slightly larger hearts and that's because they have larger bodies usually. Kind of like we talked about with the lungs, typically males have larger bodies, so they have larger lungs and larger hearts. Okay? Any two individuals, if the woman has a larger body, she would have a larger heart. Okay? But either way, the average is about 10 ounces for a human, weight-wise. Okay? Um, the capacity on average is each heartbeat can pump about 70 milliliters of blood. Okay, um, What that might translate to that might be more relatable for you all, uh, in one day the heart pumps about 1,900 gallons of blood. So you, know, you can probably visualize like what a gallon of milk looks like or a gallon of gasoline. So 1,900 of those per day. That's a lot of blood, right? Across a 75 year lifespan, 52 million gallons. This is where I'll say, I'll point out amazingly that, you know, other things get the rest. Your muscles get the rest, right? And the heart is a muscle, so this is a good analogy. But your heart never gets the rest, right? It is always contracting and relaxing, contracting, and relaxing for your whole life. The only thing that varies is the rate at which the contraction occurs uh, and the intensity of the contraction, the contraction occurs as well. Um, but it never gets to rest, so it's an amazing organ. Um, the heart consists of three layers. Um, the most important la layer for our discussion today is the middle layer, which is known as the myocardium. So myo means muscle, cardium is heart. So the myocardium, the middle layer, is the muscle. That's the heart muscle. So that's the, the actual um, tissue in the heart that never gets to relax. It's always contracting and relaxing. It has muscle fibers. That are similar to skeletal muscle, they're a little bit different, but for the most part, they're they're very similar. Um, and we'll see what those look like in the next chapter. Okay. Uh, but it's worth noting that that muscle needs oxygen-rich blood on its own. Okay. Um, it, it can't use the blood that's flowing into the chambers. Um, there are specific um, blood vessels that supply the myocardium with oxygen-rich blood, and it needs a constant supply because as we identified, it never gets to rest, right? Um, heart attacks occur when the blood vessels that supply blood to the myocardium are blocked significantly, so oxygen-rich blood cannot get to the myocardium. Um, if a sufficient amount cannot get there, that tissue starts to die, and somebody might experience uh, heart attack. So uh, back to the heart again. So as I mentioned, uh, the right side is symbol symbolized uh, in blue. That receives the blood coming back from the body. So it's uh, deoxygenated, right? Um, so because it's deoxygenated, the right side then pumps blood back to the lungs so oxygenation can occur. Okay, so um, a lot of the blood is, is re replenished with oxygen. Now it is worth noting, not all of the oxygen is removed from the blood. So even though this shows you it's blue, there's still oxygen in that blood. Um, but there is less oxygen in the blue side versus the red side. Okay. Um, the left side then is, is shown in red and it receives oxygenated blood from the lungs. So if we notice, the right side is going to pump blood out into the lungs. And here we see the changeover. Oops. As the, uh, the blood is reoxygenated and then it's fed back into the heart here and here, specifically into the left atrium. Sorry, that keeps happening. Which it then moves into the left ventricle, at which point it is then ejected up to the brain and then down into the, uh, the lower body and torso as well, okay? So it's just this constant circuit that is working around the clock to make sure our tissues are supplied with oxygen-rich blood. Um, there is a, a wall here that divides the right and left sides and that wall is called the interventricular septum, okay? Now this is muscle. Notice this pink, this sort of like light pink area. This is 
the myocardium. This is this is a heart muscle. Okay. Um, notice that the the muscle layer is thicker on the left side versus the right, and that's because. To put it simply, there's a much greater distance that the, that the blood has to be pumped to from the left side versus the right. The right side just has to pump blood into the lungs right here, small circuit. The left side has to pump blood out into the entire body, down to your feet, top of your head, in, ends of your arms, right? So the muscle is thicker there, which means it generates more force. And that's one reason why this, we said earlier, the arterial side is the high pressure side. The heart is sort of known as the pressure head. It generates the, the force that then pressurizes that circuit, sending blood from the heart down into the rest of circulation. Um, what I want to point out from this slide, um, bullet point number three. So the heart contracts sort of uniformly, right? So the atria contract simultaneously and then the ventricles contract simultaneously, okay? Um, that allows for smooth blood flow, okay? Also note that it says about 70% of the blood returning to the atria flows directly into the ventricles before the atria contract. So only the remaining 30% moves into the ventricles due to atrial contraction. A lot of it just kind of goes right into the ventricles prior to the atria contracting. Um, I did not include a slide for this, but there are um, a series of one-way valves here and here that divide the upper and lower chambers, and that prevents backflow, okay? Um, so blood, blood can only flow one direction and that's pretty consistent throughout the whole body. Actually, we'll talk about some things that, um, control that, especially in the vein. pressure really controls that on the arterial side, but on the, the venous side, since there is less pressure, there are a series of one way valves that prohibit backflow, backflow of blood. Blood can only flow one direction. So there is a slight delay between um, atrial and ventricular contraction. It's, it's only like 0.2 seconds at the most. So it's almost immediate, but there is a slight delay to allow for as much blood to move from the atria into the ventricles prior to the ventricles contracting. Okay. Slight delay and, uh, but it's very short, anywhere from 0.1 to 0.2 seconds. Uh, all right, so we kind of mentioned the, the myocardium. So the heart does have its own uh, circulatory network, and that is, those are blood vessels that directly feed the myocardium, okay? And, and that circulation is called, as we see here in blue, uh, coronary circulation, okay? So that's where we get the term coronary heart disease, which some of you may have heard of. Um, that describes what I mentioned earlier, that the coronary blood vessels supply the myocardium. If there is blockage in one of those coronary vessels, somebody can be um, diagnosed as having coronary heart disease. If coronary heart disease progresses uh, to a certain point, then the risk of heart attack goes up, right? Because again, that myocardium needs a constant supply of oxygen-rich blood. Um, if a blockage is present, it prohibits the myocardium from, from getting enough oxygen rich blood. Um, then this condition known as ischemia develops. Ischemia basically means the demand is higher than the supply. If that continues, the myocardial tissue starts to die. Um, now, now regular muscles, skeletal muscles can use aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, both, right? Heart tissue, the myocardium, can only use aerobic metabolism to fuel the contraction. As you might remember, aerobic metabolism requires oxygen. So if oxygen is not available, the heart tissue, the myocardium, cannot continue to produce ATP to contract, and that tissue will die, right? So usually heart attacks occur when ischemia is present, again, indicating the supply for oxygen-rich blood does not meet the demand. Okay. When would the demand occur? You know, heart attacks often occur when somebody is exerting themselves 
exerting him or herself to a level they're not accustomed to. So imagine somebody who's out of shape, they don't exercise, but then they decide to go shovel snow one day. Their heart muscle is going to be contracting forcefully and it's going to be really requiring a lot of oxygen rich blood. But if they have a blockage there that's present, they're not going to be able to supply enough oxygen to the heart muscle. And then, you know, there's symptoms that start to manifest themselves in chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness. That is an indication that some ischemia is present. Okay. Enough about that though. Let's, uh, let's carry on. So you see here, um, just a number that's not super important, but it kind of shows you like the amount of um, blood flow that is required to be sent to the myocardium per minute, 200 to 250 milliliters per minute um, at rest. So when we're exercising, that goes up quite a bit. Um, so these pictures here show you um, what the coronary circulation looks like, right? So notice that we have these um, vessels that are superficial to, to a certain extent, which, you know, they supply the myocardium. So they're sort of between the outer and middle layer, right? And they wrap around that muscular layer of the heart. Um, I'm not going to ask you all to remember uh, the names of any of these, but just some of the most common ones. Um, we have the, the left coronary artery here. Um, oops. The descending posterior, that's a common one. And then we have over here, the anterior descending. Now these are very important because they supply the left side. Uh, the anterior descending is a common place where people develop blockages leading to heart attacks. You know, this, this side of the heart has more muscle mass because it's the left side. So it's going to require greater amounts of O2 rich blood, which is why there's, you know, there's kind of like more vasculature on the left side versus the right because there's more muscle mass there. So I'm just checking this out to see if there's anything that we want to specifically cover um, on this. Not really anything specific other than just to point out, um, you know, these blood vessels here, the red ones, they will dilate or constrict based upon the needs of the myocardium. When the myocardial contraction is proceeding at a higher rate, those vessels will dilate. They're going to open up. And that's going to allow more blood to flow through, which is good, right? Um, but when we're resting, sleeping, something like that, heart rate is lower, those vessels will constrict and thereby not deliver as much blood to um, that specific tissue. Now, this is actually while we're here, let's kind of take a look at this, right? This is showing us um, an obstruction present um, that could lead to an area of myocardial infarction, just means. Um, myocardial infarction means heart attack, um, but that is a, the result of cell death, right? That explains why if somebody has had a heart attack, their fitness level usually declines a great bit be because they've had death of part of their heart muscle, so they're not going to have the ability to, to deliver oxygen to the rest of the body to the extent that they did before the heart attack occurred because part of that muscle literally died off. So again, we don't need to, I'm not going to talk about this um, too much. You all just take a minute to pause, read this slide. It kind of goes into a little bit about, um, more about the condition that exists when a heart attack uh, potentially could occur. Remember hypoxia, what that means is lack of oxygen, right? So tissue hypoxia provides a stimulus for myocardial blood flow, okay? If the myocardium is experiencing hypoxia that then produces the symptoms that I mentioned earlier, such as chest pain. Um, angina pectoris is a fancy way to say chest pain. So just if you ever hear that phrase, it's basically referring to chest pain, right? Angina is pain, 
pectoris is chest. All right, so let's go to our second component. This is the arterial system, right? So just to remember, the arterial side comes off um, from the ventricles, okay? It is typically a higher pressure side because the heart is literally contracting and forcing blood into these blood vessels that we call the arteries, okay? Um, arteries deliver, as we see here, oxygen-rich blood, okay? Um, typically, they are more sort of a muscular type of blood vessel. So there is a lot of a, a type of muscle called smooth muscle that is composed that composes the arteries and that allows them to um, constrict, dilate, and then also create pressure to again drive blood flow down. Okay. Um, there is no gas exchange that, that occurs in the arteries. The arteries are simply a delivery mechanism essentially. Okay. Um, the main artery of the body is the aorta. Okay, so the left ventricle, when it contracts, it sends blood into the, the aorta. And let's jump, let's see, we can see here um, that this is the aorta that kind of comes up out of the left ventricle and wraps around. And then the aorta immediately splits off into smaller arteries that supply the head and the upper extremities. Okay, and then it wraps around and can send blood again splitting off into more arteries that then send blood to the lower part of the torso and uh, the legs i'm not really worried about you all remembering um, a lot of these names that we see here um, the valves are named here so uh, the valves that separate the atria from the ventricles are called the mitral valves. We have your bicuspid and your tricuspid. And then the valves that separate the ventricles from the aorta, that one is known as the semilunar or aortic valve. And then the one that separates the right ventricle from the um, the main pulmonary artery is known as the where is it, where is it? Oops. Uh, the tricuspid valve. Now there is um, a vessel that is not referred to that we I want to mention to you all. You have arteries are the big vessels the high pressure you then have an, an the, the smaller sort of the next sequence is called it an art, arterial okay and that's not on this powerpoint but i wanted to share it with you um, arterials essentially are smaller arteries so once these big arteries start to branch off into smaller arteries they become arterials so they're smaller arterials are really going to be the ones that helped um, that can dilate and constrict a lot right so as we'll talk about the cardiovascular system responds to different activities by sending more blood to areas that need it and, and, and closing off blood somewhat to areas that don't need it, right? So when we're exercising, we're going to open up arterials that supply our muscles. We want to send more blood there. But we're going to constrict blood to a certain extent that supplies like our digestive system when we're exercising because that's not going to be important um, contributor to us performing exercise. Now, when we're Laying in our bed, the opposite occurs. We restrict blood flow to our muscles and we um, dilate and encourage more blood flow to our digestive system, right? Um, so the arterioles are really the specific blood vessel that can help us do that. It helps adjust blood flow to different tissues. So we have our arteries, arterioles, and then the next component are the capillaries. Um, so the capillaries are the smallest blood vessels. Um, oh, here's the word arterial, good, so it is there. Arterials continue to branch off into smaller and less muscular vessels called, well, I don't know about meta-arterials. This is just another form of an arterial. Eventually, though, those arterials are going to branch off into tiny, notice it says microscopically small blood vessels called capillaries. Okay. 
So capillaries essentially wrap every tissue. Kind of notice this, um, they call it a capillary bed. Imagine there's like a muscle here, right? Capillaries surround a muscle and it is at the level of the capillaries where gas exchange occurs. So oxygen diffuses from a capillary into the tissue. CO2 diffuses from the tissue into the capillary, right? So we have arterial circulation or yeah, arterial circulation delivering O2-rich blood, the diffusion occurs, oxygen moves into the tissue, CO2 moves from the tissue into the blood, and then that CO2 is transported back up to the lungs where it can be expelled, right? So they're, they're very thin, they're very delicate, they're only a single layer of cells where, you know, other blood vessels are thicker, multi-layer um, vessels. Capillaries are very thin, but they're that reason for a purpose, and that purpose is to allow gas molecules, oxygen, and CO2 to move across them, you know, very easily, okay? Because they are so, del so delicate, though, at the capillaries is where the pressure really drops, right? The arterial circulation is very high pressure, but once, blood, once the blood gets to the level of the capillaries, the pressure is dropped quite a bit, right? And it's very consistent as well. The pressure in the ar arteries is more pulsatile in nature, and that is reflected by blood pressure, right? We have a normal blood pressure, 120 over 80. 120 is high, 80 is low. Um, at the level of the capillaries, it's much more consistent to keep that steady driving force of O2-rich blood into the capillaries, okay? They are so narrow, notice here, only one blood cell can squeeze through at a time, and that is what is shown in uh, this picture, okay? So what this is showing us is that, you know, you know, just as we talked about how the arterioles can divert blood flow, the capillaries have the capacity to do that as well. Okay, when we're at rest, as we see in this picture, some of our capillary network will be closed off because we don't need it at that time. Okay, um, because the muscle that we're talking about in this picture is not active, so it doesn't need as much O2-rich blood. Now, once we started exercising, if we were using that specific muscle, Notice that these things, they're known as pre-capillary sphincters, which are basically like um, doors. They open up and that allows blood to flow in, right? So at rest, we do not utilize the full capillary bed, but during exercise, we do utilize the full capillary bed, allowing as much oxygen to be extracted from the blood and enter into that muscle um, as possible. From there, then we get into the venous system. So this is by far the lowest pressure of the system, right? Um, this is primarily going to carry blood back from the tissues up to the lungs where it can be reoxygenated. So we primarily have deoxygenated blood in uh, the veins. Um, just as we saw with the arteries to the arterioles, we have a smaller vein known as a venule, okay? Venules are small veins that have been joined together into our larger, more properly named veins, okay? And then ultimately, all of the veins in our lower body in, empty into sort of a master vein known as the vena cava. This is the, body, the body's largest vein, okay? Um, now, arteries are more deep. Veins are superficial. So typically, you know, when you, the blood vessels you can see through your skin, those are going to be veins, okay? Um, that's also good from a pressure perspective. If you nick an artery, that's where blood will literally shoot out, right? A vein, the pressure is much lower, so the blood typically kind of just drips or runs out. If you nick a vein, blood's going to shoot out, right? So if you've, ever, if you've ever seen that in a movie, it may appear sort of comical and fictional, but, you know, if a vein gets, I'm sorry, if an artery gets nicked or punctured, the pressure is typically so high in an artery that that's where blood would really shoot out um, in, a, in a rapid sort of a projectile fashion. All right, so then as we mentioned, um, blood comes back from the veins, enters into the right atrium, it then passes into the right ventricle, the right ventricle then pump, pumps it into the lungs, where it enters pulmonary capillaries. That is where, again, gas exchange is going to occur, okay, and then the blood is, uh, has oxygen loaded back into it from the lungs, and then it enters into 
the left side of the heart and then gets pumped out to the body and it just makes this nice circuit that goes around and around and around. Um, now, as I mentioned, it is sort of obvious that blood can only flow in one direction. Um, the pressure generated by the heart promotes arterial blood flowing one direction. But because the pressure is so much lower in the veins, there are some other mechanisms that have to be utilized um, to make sure blood does not backflow in uh, venous circulation. Okay? There's a couple mechanisms that do that. Uh, first of all, muscle contraction helps promote pushing blood back up to the lungs. All right, so um, we said the, the veins are more superficial, which means they're more kind of like um, on the outside of muscles, they run through muscles. So whenever a muscle contracts, it's going to squeeze blood through the veins, pushing it one direction. Okay, That one direction is sort of controlled by the fact that we have these, uh, what's shown here, one-way valves. Okay, So there's a picture on this next slide that shows this, right? Uh, there are valves that prohibit backflow. So blood, shoot, sorry, blood can only flow one direction. And sorry, that's the wrong, that's this direction, right? The valve would only open this way. Blood cannot backflow, okay? So if this muscle contracts and this vein is sort of squeezed between these two muscles, it's going to push blood the only way it can go, which is going to be up through this valve. And then even if it contracted and pushed blood this way, it could not backflow past this valve. So in our veins, we have these valves, you know, located, you know, probably something like every quarter to half inch, you have one of these valves that exists purely to prohibit backflow. Okay. If you've ever noticed somebody who has varicose veins in their legs, that results from these valves failing. So due to certain lifestyle factors, these valves can become damaged and fail. And in that, if they fail, then blood is allowed to backflow and, and that can create an issue, right? Um, healthy cardiovascular system, these valves work perfectly. Backflow in the venous circulation is prohibited. So I think there's a question where I ask you all, um, the mechanisms that promote venous return. Venous return basically is the phrase we used to set to describe blood flowing back from the veins to the lungs for reoxygenation. You have your one-way valves. You have what we call the muscle pump, which is shown again uh, in this picture. And then there is a third thing, which is not listed on this slide. That's the respiratory pump that by your, your lungs uh, contracting, relaxing, you create sort of a suction effect that pulls blood from your lower extremities, your legs, backed up to the thoracic cavity where the gas exchange is going to occur. So I've referred to pressure a couple times um, in this lecture so far, and that pressure, of course, is what we call more commonly blood pressure, right? So blood pressure um, exists to, again, drive O2-rich blood from the heart, I'm peeling an orange right now, that's what I'm looking at, um, drive blood from the heart down to the capillaries so the gas exchange can occur, giving our muscles the oxygen that it, they need to produce ATP to continue to allow for movement and contraction to occur, right? So this pressure is generated by the heart. Every time it contracts, there is uh, pressure generated, but the muscle that is contained in the arteries and the arterioles also helps create this pressure, right? So we have this sort of um, muscle tone that is always present in our arteries and arterioles that keeps some pressure on that fluid moving through. Fluid by fluid, I mean the blood, right? Um, so that's why even when the heart is relaxing, there is still pressure, right? So when we, when we look at the normal blood pressure of 120 over 80, um, the 120 is what we call the systolic pressure. That's the pressure when the heart is contracting. And then the diastolic pressure, the lower number, so in that case, the 80, that is the pressure when the heart is um, relaxing, right? And so there's still pressure there, and that pressure is generated by the muscular activity of the arteries in the arterioles, okay? Um, Uh, 
Uh, so again, systolic blood pressure is the first number. And again, that represents the pressure when the heart contracts. Okay. And, and what that is really a measurement of, it's the, it's the pressure exerted against the walls of the arteries. Okay. And, and blood pressure is expressed in a unit known as millimeters of mercury, which is essentially the pressure required to elevate a little bead of mercury, which you might have seen in thermometers or in a blood pressure device, a certain height. Okay, so 120 millimeters would be a, a, a height, 80 would also be a height, and, but it's the pressure required to move that mercury to a certain height. I'm going to take a bite of this orange. Now we also express blood pressure in another way, mean arterial pressure, which we abbreviate as the MAP. And the MAP represents more the average. Um, so up near the heart, where we have the contraction and relaxation occurring, the pressure is a little bit more pulsatile in nature, high, low, high, low, high, low. But by the time we get out to the arterioles and to the capillaries in particular, farther away from the heart, the pressure sort of evens out and it's more of an average pressure, okay? And that's good because we wanna, we want that pressure constantly pushing blood into the capillaries, not to be up and down, up and down, up and down the way it is at the heart, but more average. And the arterioles allow for that um, pressure difference to kind of minimize, resulting in more of an average pressure, okay? So I'm not gonna talk much more about that, but you might see mean arterial pressure um, noted somewhere and that's what that is referring to. Here we see um, the numbers that are considered normal. So 120 or less, over 80 or less, that is normal. Once we start getting above these numbers, um, then we start getting into sort of a, a disease state. So um, hypertension is a condition associated with chronically high blood pressure, and that is associated with a, a systolic pressure greater than 140 or a diastolic greater than 90. Um, if somebody's is above 160 or 100, that's known as stage two hypertension. Uh, this, this term of pre-hypertension is, is a little bit newer on the scene. Uh, and what that means is you're sort of in danger of developing hypertension. So if your blood pressure is consistently between 120 over 39, over 80 to 89, then typically some lifestyle mod modification is gonna be recommended at that point to lessen the possibility of the person developing um, hypertension. So lifestyle modification means start exercising, eat better, try to lose a little weight. Typically that can, can help quite a bit, okay? Here we see um, prevalence in different age groups. Um, so obviously, as with most diseases, right, lifestyle related, the, uh, the risk or the incidence of these is going to increase with age. Notice that it's more common in men at younger ages, um, but then it becomes more common in women at older ages. Mm, I don't know why that is, honestly. Um, I don't think, I don't know that there's been a theory postulated about that yet. Um, it is more common in the African American population than in the white population. And that seems to be due to some genetic differences um, that lead to higher pressures in the art arteries in blacks versus whites, okay? But again, these are just the averages. Um, again, what could we relate this upper part of the chart to? It could be to the declining physical activity levels, right? Um, as people get older, they tend to become less physically active. Uh, they tend to put on weight, and that is definitely correlated with high blood pressure. So simply getting older doesn't mean you're going to have higher blood pressure, but because as you get older, you're less likely to be active, that could then lead to having higher blood pressure. Okay, so when in doubt, be active, eat well. Your risk of developing not only this disease, but any chronic disease is going to be greatly reduced, right? Just because you're getting older doesn't mean your blood pressure has to go up. Stay active eat well, control your body weight.
So what we want to look at with this is how does blood pressure change during exercise? Um, it will go up, okay? Systolic blood pressure will increase in a linear relationship with intensity. So the higher the exercise intensity, the higher the systolic pressure should go, okay? However, the diastolic pressure should stay the same regardless if you're active or not, okay? Um, it might go down, might stay the same, might go up a little bit, but it should stay pretty consistent around that, uh, whatever your resting diastolic blood pressure is, okay? Um, now, as a result of training, exercise, being fit, can have a, a positive impact on blood pressure, which means it should decline with training. So people who are more active, they're going to have a greater um, chance of having a normal blood pressure versus people who are sedentary, okay? I'm not going to get into the specifics of why that occurs today, and we'll save that for another class probably down the road for you all. Um, so this is actually looking at steady state exercise um, versus intense exercise. Again, don't worry too much about the differences, but do know what I said earlier, um, that systolic increases linearly with exercise intensity. So the higher the intensity goes, the higher the systolic will go. However, the diastolic blood pressure should remain stable or decrease slightly regardless of exercise intensity. It's not uncommon for a healthy fit individual um, exercising maximally to get a, a systolic pressure up to 200 millimeters of mercury. When you're exercising, that's okay. Um, at rest, obviously, that would be a, a great danger and a risk. And this kind of shows graphically what that would look like. As treadmill speed increases, or this is, sorry, this is treadmill percent grade, we should see an increase linearly with exercise intensity with systolic pressure while diastolic should remain relatively unchanged or might even decrease slightly. Wow, so that's going to finish chapter 15. That was a, a long chapter there. Uh, what we're going to look at with chapter 16 is more what controls blood pressure. So, um, internal, external factors that control, uh, in this case, I think I said blood pressure, I meant to say cardiovascular system, but yeah, what controls the cardiovascular system? What causes it to increase, decrease its activity, uh, et cetera. So, um, unlike other tissues, the cardiac muscle does maintain its own rhythm. It has its own sort of autorhythmicity. Um, our nervous system has to cause our skeletal muscles to contract. Cardiac muscle contracts on its own. Okay, It has its own inherent rhythmicity. Okay, um, If it was left on its own without any... In now, the brain can control the rate of contraction. But if the brain is taken off, if we somehow disconnected our brain from our heart, the heart would be at 100 beats per minute, okay? It has this autorhythmic sort of um, electrical depolarization that occurs in a rhythmic fashion that allows the heart to contract, as we see here, at 100 beats per minute, okay? Uh, and the specific group of cells that cause this contraction, these are known as the, it's known as the pacemaker of the heart, is the SA, which stands for sinoatrial, the SA node, okay? It is referred to as the heart's pacemaker. The SA node is found up at the top of the right atrium right here. Okay? Sorry. So once the these cells depolarize, which means they generate an electrical signal, that signal is then propagated throughout the heart, sort of following the arrows that we see here. So notice that the signal is moved around here. Eventually, another group of cells that are autorhythmic, known as the AV node, they get stimulated to contract, and then they conduct the signal down into the ventricles, sort of following this green path, which wraps down through the septum, and then it splits off and wraps up around the ventricles, okay? So the, the pattern of contraction follows that path that we just saw. 
we said earlier the atria contract briefly prior to the ventricles. So the SA node depolarizes, and again, depolarization just means generates an electrical signal, okay? But that signal then causes the contraction of the tissue, okay? So SA node contract, um, depolarizes, signal moves down, that causes the atria to contract, so blood then moves from the atria to the ventricles. Um, then the AV node, propagates that signal down into the ventricles, causing the ventricles to contract. And you notice here the time sequence is shown um, that does indicate um, that the atria contract, contract literally a split second prior to the contraction of the ventricles. By 0.2 seconds, we should have blood entering the, uh, the arteries. The other conductile cells are the of the bundle branches, which are here, right and left, right and left, and then we have our Purkinje fibers. Um, but a healthy heart will follow the action of the SA node. Um, the SA node will contract on its own, and then the signal will be conducted following that path that we that I mentioned a few seconds ago. Now I did mention there's a delay. Um, between the atria and ventricles, and that delay is known as the AV nodal delay. It's 0.1 second. So that occurs again here, basically sort of across here. That delay allows for as much blood to move into the ventricles before they contract, okay? So it's short, but again, that allows as much blood to flow from the atria to the ventricles, and it's about 0 0.10 seconds. Uh, and again, here's the sequence of the transmission of the uh, the cardiac impulse. SA node through the atria to the AV, AV node, then down into the uh, bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers, and then ultimately into uh, the ventricles, and they would all contract. But notice that all of that occurs in uh, 0.2 seconds is about the time it takes for the heart to contract, so very rapid. So all of that electrical activity can be um, measured and graphed using a device known as an electrocardiogram, which I'm guessing a lot of you have heard of. It's more commonly known as an EKG or an ECG, it means the same thing, okay? Um, electrodes are placed on a person's torso and a special device known as an EKG is then used to measure the electrical signals that are generated from the depolarization of those cells that we just talked about, okay? Um, and then that's, that activity can be graphed on a, into a picture that looks a lot like this, okay? Um, so the typical classic EKG looks like this, okay? And, and what each of these waves are called represents is a different aspect of the contraction of the heart. Uh, the P wave here symbolizes the uh, contraction of the atria, okay? Uh, and then the largest wave, the QRS complex, it's called, that is the depolarization or the contraction of the ventricles. We said earlier the ventricles are a very, the, have a lot of muscle mass. More muscle mass is going to generate a larger electrical impulse, which is why this signal is so much larger compared to this one. Okay. And then the T wave is the relaxation of the ventricles. Again, the muscle mass is so big there that even the relaxation of the ventricles causes some electrical activity that can be measured using an EKG, okay? Uh, now down the road, if you all take another lab, we'll take a look at this, especially if I teach it, because I, I, do, I do teach EKG in uh, my labs at my other university. Um, I just didn't want to introduce it to you all in this class because this is a sort of a, a class for a lot of you are freshman sophomores, but this is a little bit more of an advanced technique, so we won't say any much more about it today. I wanted to just introduce it to you today, and then in the future we can go into it in more detail and have and have laps about it, which is which are fun. Okay, so what controls activity? 
We said earlier the heart, if it's on its own, it would depolarize at 100 beats per minute, right? But as a lot of you know, your heart rate is almost never 100. It's either lower than that or it's higher than that. So there's input that is given from the body, funneled into the brain, and then that information is integrated and then the brain sends information to the heart to either speed it up or slow it down, okay? So at rest, our heart rate is lower than 100 because the brain is acting to slow the heart down using a specific part of the nervous system that we'll talk about in a second, okay? When we're exercising, our heart rate is higher than 100 because the brain is acting to speed it up, okay? So the brain is getting input from a lot of different things, and those are things that we see on this slide here, okay? So, for example, uh, when your muscles are contracting, that movement, that um, activity sends information to your brain that says, hey, we need more oxygen-rich blood, so you need to tell the heart to speed up, and that's exactly what happens, right? Uh, we also have other um, reflexes that occur. Baroreceptor refers to um, pressure, right? So when the pressure changes in certain arteries, that can affect cardiovascular activity. Um, when we have um, chemical changes in certain areas of the body, that can also affect cardiovascular activity. So, for instance, if, if CO2 starts accumulating in a certain part of the body, cardiovascular activity is going to be increased, right? Because that's there are receptors that are sensitive to CO2. When they detect high CO2, they tell the brain, and the brain then speeds up the heart, right? So we're, we're really, the, the ner nervous system is constantly getting information from the body, and it's sending signals to the cardiovascular system to control its, its activity. So yeah, these neural influences then can basically override the inherent rhythm and either slow it down or speed it up, okay? So there are two specific pathways in our nervous system that do this and they are known as the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so think of the sympathetic nervous system is like the gas pedal in your car, right? When you step on the gas, the car speeds up. When the sympathetic nervous system stimulates the heart, it speeds it up. So it drives your heart rate up. The parasympathetic nervous system are the brakes of your car. When you step on the brakes, the car slows down. When the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulating the heart, it slows it down. So at rest, the parasympathetic nervous system is dominant. Okay, imagine that they're always here, but one is dominant over the other, right? Um, when we're exercising, we're in sympathetic dominance. Once we stop exercising, we move more even. And then when we're resting, we're in parasympathetic dominance, right? Another way to look at these is the sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight, so it gets you ready for action, where your parasympathetic nervous system is your rest and digest. It allows you to recover and rebuild, okay? These things also can help determine blood flow in addition to things like heart rate and blood pressure. And this just kind of shows us that these are two neural pathways that are linked out of the brain, uh, and they, they both have direct inputs on the SA node, sorry, and the AV node. When the, when the parasympathetic nervous system is dominant, it slows the SA node down. When the sympathetic nervous system is dominant, it speeds the SA node and these other nodes up um, to increase heart rate and therefore, or thereby increase blood flow uh, as well. Uh, now, this is an interesting chart that kind of shows how the two divisions of the nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, influence organs. Um, but it really all functions exactly how, is it, how I described it, where the sympathetic nervous system speeds everything up. So it would uh, speed up breathing, speed up your heart rate, um, stimulates the release of adrenaline from your adrenal glands. Okay, um, It actually inhibits digestive and renal activity, okay, where the parasympathetic nervous system slows breathing down, 
slows the heart down, stimulates digestion, stimulates intestinal activity, stimulates urine production, right? Because these are all activities that are associated with rest and digest, where these over here are activities that are associated with fight or flight, right? So we have these two aspects of our nervous system that kind of work in opposite fashion based upon what we're doing at a given time. Pause it, take a minute to read this. This just tells us the two um, hormones that are associated with the sympathetic nervous system. These are more commonly known as adrenaline, right? Um, and they cause a lot of different things to happen. Um, they cause vasoconstriction to occur in arteries, which actually helps drop, increase the pressure to drop blood to certain places. But it causes dilation of the coronary arteries, which is good because that allows us to get more blood flow into the heart. Parasympathetic, as we said, typically is going to inhibit a lot of things which would decrease its activity. So again, hit pause, take a second to read these bullet points, and I'm going to go ahead and move on. As I mentioned, we also get some, some some input from the periphery, which is like outside in the body, the rest of the body away from the brain and heart. It's always giving feedback to our brain to, to help us adjust breathing, heart rate, uh, etc. Two specific types of receptors are important for this. We have our chemoreceptors, which are sensitive to the chemical environment. So that's gonna be monitoring things like oxygen levels, CO2 levels, hydrogen levels, right? O2 is low and CO2 is high. That's going to cause breathing and cardiovascular activity to go up. If O2 is high and CO2 is low, that could decrease cardiovascular and respiratory activity. Um, then we have mechanoreceptors that are sensitive to stretching. So guess where mechanoreceptors are located? They're located in muscles, right? When muscles are contracting, mechanoreceptors are stimulated. And that input is, is integrated in the brain and then an appropriate response is given to the cardiovascular system, right? So when muscles are contracting, cardiovascular system is going to be stimulated to increase its activity. When muscles are relaxing, cardiovascular activity is going to be decreased. Exercise effect on blood flow. Um, I sort of already touched on this a second ago, um, but just to kind of quickly summarize it, areas that need blood during activity, they get their blood flow increased. In areas that don't need blood flow during activity, they get their blood flow reduced, right? So muscles, um, skin typically see an increase in blood flow during exercise, where areas such as the, the kidneys, the liver, the stomach, they see blood flow reduced during exercise, right? Because when you're running for your life, you're not going to be worried about digestion or going to the bathroom. Um, and when you're resting, it flips, right? We start sending more blood flow to the kidneys and liver, less blood flow to muscles and skin, okay? Um, all right, so I'm going to hit now, head to the last uh, chapter, chapter 17. All right, so chapter 17... <clears throat> Functional capacity of the cardiovascular system. What does that mean? I don't know. Let's find out. <clears throat> so here we're going to get into some things that are familiar, luckily. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed at this point, here are some familiar terms. Um, what we're really concerned about in exercise physiology is not that the heart beats, but how much blood does it pump out? Per heartbeat, per minute. And we know that the amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart per minute is known as the cardiac output. Cardiac output, we abbreviate as the Q. Cardiac output is a function of heart rate times stroke volume. So amount of heartbeats per minute, amount of blood per beat gives us amount of blood per minute. Okay. <clears throat> And, you know, the FIC principle is one, is again, one that we've already talked about. You all have, have written it out on uh, an exam. Most of you got that one right, which is good. This, this diagram here shows us 
sort of graphically what the thick equation is talking about. Um, so uh, amount of blood that is being pumped out and then how much blood is being extracted, right? This is the AVO2 difference that shows us um, how much oxygen is in the arterial blood, 20 milliliters of O2 per 100 milliliters of blood versus in the venous blood, 15 milliliters. So basically the AVO2 difference then is what? It's five milliliters or um, 5,000 per 100 milliliters of blood, okay? Or it would be, don't worry about this, that's confusing, right? It would be five, as it shows here, because there was 20 in the arterial, there's only 15 in the venous, therefore at the capillary level, five milliliters of oxygen were removed, right? Um, if we were exercising, if this was an active muscle, then you would see a lot less here, and therefore the difference would be greater because the muscles are extracting more oxygen from that arterial blood. And this is showing us just some average numbers um, of cardiac output. So notice in a trained individual, and this is an endurance trained person, so somebody who is like a runner, cyclist, swimmer, triathlete, whatever, they have a much higher uh, cardiac output capacity versus an untrained person, right? Almost 13,000 more milliliters per minute due to some of the cardiovascular adaptations that occur in response to training. Here are some mechanisms that could um, explain that difference, right? So mainly the differences that we see in cardiac output are due to changes in stroke volume. That's really the key, okay? Stroke volume improves for the reasons that we see uh, here. First of all, uh, we have more filling time. Um, so because if you're trained, your heart rate is lower, that allows more time for filling. Think about it, your heart fills with blood when it's relaxing. If your heart rate is always pegged out super high, there's less relaxation time, less filling time. If through fitness adaptations, your heart rate is lower at a given intensity, there is more relaxation time, which means more time for filling, more blood coming in, more blood coming out, right? So that's where enhanced cardiac filling comes from. As more blood is entering into that chamber, there is a greater stretch of that chamber, okay? The greater that chamber of the ventricles is stretched, the more forceful a contraction. Uh, imagine it's like a rubber band, right? If you, if you just kind of barely stretch that rubber band and let go, it doesn't contract very forcefully. But if you stretch that rubber band all the way out as far as it'll go and let go, it's going to contract a lot more forcefully. Your heart kind of functions in the same way, right? The more blood that is entering into that ventricle, the more that ventricle is being stretched. So when it's released, it contracts with more force. That's also going to pump out more blood, okay? <clears throat> Those are the two key factors. Um, and then there are some other adaptations that occur that allow for less resistance to be um, out in the tissues. So that means there is less pressure that the blood has to overcome as it's exiting the heart which then allows more blood to exit per heartbeat, right? So training really improves stroke volume through the mechanisms we just went through, and that then translates to greater cardiac output and then in turn, uh, greater, higher VO2, of course. Kind of just went through this with my previous points I went through. Um, but again, pause, read this. One thing I'll say is that force of contraction is known as the Frank Starling law. Um, that the more blood that enters causing that stretch, the more blood that's going to be ejected. Okay. Um, those are two scientists, Frank and Starling, who discovered that mechanism and often laws are named after the people who discovered them. Okay. I'm a little bit slap happy right now, so if I'm acting goofy, just know that it's late in the afternoon. I don't usually do these in the afternoon, so maybe I'll do them more often. Maybe this is more entertaining. I don't know. I could also be very annoying right now, but we'll carry on, okay? 
Um, all right, so uh, now this is something we touched on in the previous chapter, but notice how blood, redis blood flow is changed. And this is looking at the percent of cardiac output at rest during exercise. So at rest, muscles only get 20% of cardiac output. During exercise, we're looking at 84%, right? And that's 84% of a much large, oops, oh gosh. A much larger number. 84% of 21 of 25,000 is 21,000 milliliters. 20% of 5,000 is only a thousand milliliters. So during exercise, we literally are pumping 20,000 more milliliters of oxygen rich blood to our muscles compared to at rest. But there's a trade off, right? If we're sending more to one place, we have to send less to other places. And that's why. You know, we went from this big colorful pie chart here to very small pieces of the color pie over here. Um, now, this is a little bit deceiving because the, the overall amount changes so much. So the heart, notice, it gets 4% here and 4% here. So the amount of blood flow that goes to the heart stays the same, which makes sense because the heart's always beating whether we're resting or exercising. The overall, the overall amount is going to change from a thousand or to a thousand because again, the overall amount of blood flow is much higher during exercise. Okay. Um, now what else can we look at? The brain is another one at rest 14%. It goes down slightly, but the overall amount is higher during exercise. Um, at rest, the kid, the liver 27%. During exercise, it only gets 2%, and the overall amount is actually also lower, 1350 here versus 500 here. Kidneys, similar situation, 22%, 1%, 1100 milliliters, 250 milliliters, okay? So those are the two major tissues that see a reduction. Liver and kidneys get a lot at rest. They get a very small amount at during exercise because, again, that fight or flight means we need to run or fight somebody, which means our muscles need a lot of oxygen-rich blood. So we're going to send almost all of our blood there to allow us to survive that activity that we're doing. We're not worried about blood filtering or uh, waste production when we're fighting for our lives, obviously, right? But this is a really interesting chart. This is another chart that's like when you, if you understand exercise physiology, this is a really key chart to uh, sort of understand. Because the pie is only so big, right? So when we are giving more pieces of the pie to one area, we got to give less pieces of the pie to another area. Um, factors that affect AVO2 difference during physical activity. Um, as we sort of talked about um, earlier in this lecture, when we're exercising, more of our capillaries open up. Remember, at rest, some of the, some of the capillaries were closed, okay? Which means there's going to be less ability to extract oxygen. When we're exercising, all of the capillaries open up, which means there's greater opportunity for oxygen extraction. And that explains why the AVO2 difference increases so much. If we just jump back a couple slides and look at this. Wait, that wasn't it. Well, she, it wasn't there. My fault. But you get the point. Um, we're going to be extracting more oxygen out of, out of the blood when we're exercising. And that is aided by the fact that more capillaries um, are going to open up. Okay. Plus, as we mentioned earlier, we're also sending more blood to our muscles anyways. That's also going to help uh, quite a bit. Okay. And training actually sort of teaches our bodies how to be better um, at redirecting blood, right? So going back to this pie chart, an unfit person who's exercising like for the first time in forever, their pie chart might not look like this. But uh, a seasoned exerciser, a well-trained person, somebody who is uh, habitually active, their chart might look like this and therefore they're going to be able to send more blood to their muscles, have a greater AVO2 difference, and what's that going to result in? Uh, higher exercise capacity, okay? So um, that was 
a lot of words. Only an hour and 10 minutes, not as bad as I thought it would be. Um, so for your lab this week, we're gonna talk about resting cardiovascular measurements, uh, specifically how to measure heart rate and how to measure blood pressure. We're gonna do that in three different body positions. Uh, supine is laying on your back, seated and then standing. And we're gonna you know, look at the minimal changes that occur in heart rate and blood pressure in those three body positions. I'm also going to go over the process of measuring blood pressure in detail. Um, <clears throat> this is not something I would expect you all to, to learn. Obviously, watching a video, you really need, really need to do it to learn it. Um, so hopefully in the future, you'll have a, an in-person lab where you'll have an opportunity to do that uh, because it's one of those skills that really requires a, a lot of practice, okay? So watch that video clip. It's a it's about 20 minutes long. It's one solid clip. It's a little bit longer. Um, so watch that. You'll complete the lab. And um, that is it for this unit. As I mentioned, due to the holiday, I extended the due date of these through um, to Sunday um, in case you're home for the holidays or anything along those lines. Um, as usual, if you have any questions, email me and let me know. Otherwise, I will talk to you all again soon.